USS Pennsylvania had been very lucky on December 7th, 1941. Despite attempts by Japanese torpedo bombers to destroy the dry dock she was in, then attempts by Japanese dive bombers to bomb her from on high, and then finally attempts by Japanese fighters to strafe her, she'd only actually taken one direct hit, which had made its way to one of the casement guns before exploding. She'd actually ended up being more at risk from her dry dock mates, the destroyers Cassin and Downs, which had themselves been hit by bombs which were intended for Pennsylvania, and then subsequently caught fire, and then exploded. Burning fuel, flying wreckage, and various other things had then proved more of a danger to Pennsylvania's continued survival than the Japanese aircraft themselves. Although Tennessee and Maryland had slightly fewer dead, Pennsylvania still had a relatively low casualty count and had the least damage of all the battleships present. She was therefore the first of the battleships from the attack to be made ready for sea and sail for the mainland for what repairs she needed, along with a substantial refit to her secondary and anti-aircraft batteries. Following this, the ship would see action in a number of campaigns, opening her active duty with the Aleutian Islands campaign, which would also start a long trend of the Japanese doing their level best to hit her, and failing. On the 12th of May 1943, the submarine I-31 fired a torpedo at her, but luckily an orbiting PBY Catalina spotted the launch and the ship was able to evade. Off the Gilbert Islands in November 1943, several waves of night-flying torpedo bombers likewise failed to hit her. Indeed, during this time, the only damage the ship sustained was from a pair of explosions that were related to her aviation fuel storage systems, which was, of course, entirely a self-inflicted injury. 1944 saw similar luck. Multiple shore bombardment missions were carried out, with no particularly accurate counterfire from land-based artillery, and once again the only damage was self-inflicted, when she accidentally rammed a troop transport in the assembly area for the Marianas campaign. The year ended with her being present at the Battle of Surigao Strait, although in this case her lucky escape at Pearl Harbor actually worked against her. As she'd been able to be refitted fairly quickly and early on in the US involvement in the war, she still carried relatively early versions of surface search and gunnery control radar and was therefore unable to participate in the destruction of the Japanese Southern Force. Nonetheless, she was able to take a steady toll of Japanese strike and kamikaze aircraft over the close of 1944, taking no damage despite a number of near misses. Entering 1945, it seemed like the ship was still living her charmed life. The closest the Japanese seemed to get this year was a near miss, causing damage to a secondary battery fire control director with shrapnel when she stopped by the still-occupied Wake Island to send some 14-inch high explosive their way on her way to her actual destination. This done, her journey continued onwards to Okinawa, where she was to become the flagship of Task Force 95. She arrived there on the 12th of August 1945 and took her station in Buckner Bay, alongside fellow Pearl Harbor veteran USS Tennessee. But that night, her charmed life would come to an end in a sudden and almost fatal way. To put things into context a little, the atomic bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki had already been dropped, the first almost a week earlier and the second three days prior. Two days earlier, on the 10th, the Japanese government had signalled that it was willing to surrender. However, there was a window of several days between that announcement and the formal acceptance by the Japanese government of the Allied surrender terms. And it would be in this window that Pennsylvania now found herself. As the sun began to set, an intel warning was sent out that air attack was still possible. Since Taranto, Pearl Harbor, and numerous other incidents during the war had shown just how vulnerable ships were if they were caught stationary whilst under torpedo attack, the fleet took precautions. In previous years, when given warning of an incoming air raid, for example, the German battleship Tirpitz had, amongst other measures, used powerful smoke generators aboard and ashore to cover her and the surrounding area in a thick blanket of artificial smoke, thus making her almost impossible to hit. Now, the US fleet did the same with their own smoke generators. Unfortunately, once again, Pennsylvania's early refit came up to bite her. The ship did not have such generators aboard, 
Instead, some smaller ships, which did have them, tried to circle the battleship to provide the necessary smoke cover, but the prevailing wind kept blowing the smoke away. Then came the attack. In common with a number of other late war Japanese attacks, including those that had nearly sunk both Bunker Hill and Franklin, this was no mass assault. Instead, a lone assassin swept through the skies, and upon dropping into the bay, could only see one large target, thanks to the smoke that was covering all of the others. And so, the torpedo went into the water, and the aircraft roared off into the darkness. Now, winding time back a little bit, we're going to go over Pennsylvania's deck log for the day, as it gives a fairly good idea of what the ship was doing and how the attack unfolded. The deck logs are written in a format where every four hours, a lieutenant who's on duty records what happened during that period. Between 0400 and 0800 hours, Lieutenant F.M. Hawley recorded 0416, reduced speed to 15 knots, 155 RPM. 0521, set special C and anchor detail. 0525, cut in degaussing systems. 0530, changed course left to 267. 0546, changed course left to 262. 0533 commenced manoeuvring on various courses at various speeds conforming to the channel. 0559 lighted ship. 0603 passed anti torpedo nets. 0705 all engines stopped. 0706 moored starboard side to port side of USS Tennessee in berth L84, Buckner Bay, Okinawa. 0706 set material condition yoke. 0734 secured special sea and anchor detail. 0750 secured fires under boilers number 1, 4, and 6. Lieutenant J.G. Asaf was on duty between 0800 and 1200 and records made daily inspection of magazines and smokeless powder samples, conditions normal. 0900, Vice Admiral J.B. Oldendorf, USN, Commander, Battleship Squadron 1, with staff and flag personnel as listed below, came aboard and hoisted his flag in this ship. There then follows an extensive list of exactly who all of the staff were, which I will skip for the sake of everyone's sanity. 0903, sounded fire call. 0906, secured from fire call. Electric fire pump overheated. 1000, by order of the commanding officer. Three men were released from confinement and restored to duty, their periods of confinement imposed by summary court-martial having expired. 1046, secured numbers 1, 4 and 6 boilers. 1130, Set special sea and anchor detail, boilers 1, 4, and 6 on the main steam line. 1139, underway from port side of Tennessee, commenced maneuvering on various courses at various speeds to shift berth. Lieutenant E.M. Lochlin then takes up the 1200 to 1600 watch, maneuvering as before. 1205, anchored in berth L93, Buckner Bay, Okinawa, in 22 fathoms of water, with 75 fathoms of chain to the starboard anchor. 1214 secured special sea and anchor detail. 1310 secured boilers numbers 1, 4, and 6. 1320 secured boiler number 2. 1523 pursuant to Comsur Pack Personnel Order 15005 of 23rd of July 1945, P.W. Behensky um, of the U.S. Navy Reserve was transferred to USS West Virginia, having completed temporary duty aboard this vessel. C.B. Cates, the lieutenant who was in charge between 1600 and 1800, simply puts no remarks. And Lieutenant F.M. Hawley, who was in charge between 1800 and 2000 for the ship's log, simply notes that at 1907 they darkened ship. However, from 2000 to 2400 hours, Lieutenant J.G. Asaf was back in charge of the deck log, and he now records... 2045, large single-engine plane sighted on starboard quarter, close aboard, carrying no lights and flying about 150 feet above the water. Ship was struck by a torpedo at about frame 131, starboard side. Set material condition zebra and count sounded air defence. Ship took a heavy trim by the stern and a slight list to starboard. The air situation at 2045 was flash white, control green. Ships present in Buckner Bay included three battleships, eight cruisers, two carriers, and other ships of Task Force 95. SOPA is CTF-95, Combat Ron 1 in Pennsylvania. 
As far as is known, this raid was not detected by any ship or by Army Fighter Command ashore. 2050 sent motor whale boat to pick up any personnel blown off the ship. It returned with two men. 2107, the fire alarm operated in magazine D410-M, sounded fire call. This and several later fire alarms were determined to be caused by short circuits in the fire alarm system due to flooding. 2110, LCS-75 came alongside port quarter to assist damage control. 2159, the port engines were reported ready to use, with inboard shaft operating stiffly. Starboard engines out of commission due to broken propeller shafting. No steering control usable. 2216, shifted fuel oil to reduce list and trim. 2226, USS Shackle, ARS-9, came alongside starboard quarter to assist. 2248, USS Memnomini, ATF-73, came alongside to port to assist. 2255, flooding under control. The following compartments believed flooded. Third deck port, frame 115 to 127. Third deck starboard, frame 103 to 127. First platform from fra frame 104 aft. Second platform from frame 109 aft. Hold below second platform from frame 103 aft, except number four shaft alley. Draft forward 28 feet 2 inches. Aft 43 feet 2 inches. 2258, LCS-75 cast off. 2303, USS Extricate, ARS-16, came alongside port quarter to assist. Received pumps and hoses from various ships in the harbour to assist in control of flooding. Midnight passed and Lieutenant Lachlan took up the deck log again from midnight to 0400. He accounts, Midnight, anchored in berth L93, Buckner Bay, Okinawa in 22 fathoms of water, with 60 fathoms of chain on the starboard bower anchor. Boilers number 2, 4, 5 and 6 are in use for auxiliary purposes. Condition of readiness 3 is being maintained with the exception of secondary and anti-aircraft batteries, which are air defence. Material condition Zebra is set. USS Extricate ARS-16, USS Memnomini ATF-73 and USS Shackle ARS-9 are alongside giving assistance in salvage work being done to control flooding from torpedo damage. The ship is darkened with the exception of lights being used to facilitate work of repair parties. 0346 flash red control green, bogey bearing 315, 45 miles. And then as dawn came along, Lieutenant Cates took over from 0400 to 0800. 0433, flash white control green. 0525, lighted fires under boilers 1 and 6. 0550, cut in boiler number 1. 0555, secured boiler number 5. 0557, secured from air defence. Set condition of readiness 3. 0557, set modified material condition zebra. 0610, cut in boiler number 6. 0619, fire reported in C-203-1, steam steering room, sounded fire quarters. 0641, fire reported out, secured from fire quarters. 0730, mustard crew on stations. The following named men were listed as missing in action. H.W. Banker, C.E. Binger, C.W. Cox, C.J. Estes, S.F. Karaswensky, R. H. Lambert, J. A. McGlone, A. M. Marvel, B. J. Olgs, R. J. Ortbulls, T. F. Queeley, J. B. Roma, B. D. Ross, V. J. Schilly, C. A. Schutzberg, L. C. Silla, E. H. Sullivan, W. L. Thompson, H. W. Weich and R. H. Wittig, most of them from the U.S. Navy Reserve. Quartermaster Drennan Judy was aboard the ship at the time and recalled, About an hour before the kamikaze attacked, it came over the ship's loudspeaker that the war was over. No one was expecting to be attacked when the bomber dropped its torpedo and struck the Pennsylvania. If I had remained in the quartermaster division steering the ship and writing the log, I would have probably been killed at Okinawa during the attack. All 20 sailors killed in that attack were in the quartermaster's compartment when the torpedo struck the ship's fantail where they were. I had been reassigned as an electrician's mate and was working a deck above in my quarters when the torpedo blew a 30-foot hole in the back of the ship. I ended up with some shrapnel injuries from the blast. 
I managed to escape in the dark down a corridor to a ladder and hatch that took me to the deck. I spent the next few days wearing only my shorts aboard ship because that was all I had. Ten other men were injured, including Admiral Oldendorf, who had several ribs broken. The ship then settled rapidly by the stern, as whilst the flooding was thought to be under control a few hours after the attack, the rest of the night and much of the following morning was sent, spent stabilising the ship and chasing down various leaks that were spreading from the initial areas of confinement through doors and hatches that had either been left open or blown open, or in some cases had been warped just enough that whilst they would shut, they weren't entirely watertight. Just how close the ship came to sinking can be seen from pictures taken the following day, with hoses even being run through the barrels of the aft turret to keep the water being pumped out at least as fast as it was coming in. Apart from the sheer visual impression that this makes, it also needs to be pointed out that various features of battleship construction also combine to make this photo even more perilous than it might seem. The decks of battleships have numerous hatches and vents which offer pathways into the ship for people and air. In rough seas, this can already be, result in an unwelcome amount of water coming down, and if the stern had dropped another few feet, then continuous water infiltration would have had a stacked effect on the damage control efforts, since not only would there be more water entering the ship, hence the need for even more pumping, but it would also have cut off access and ventilation to a considerable portion of the stern, which would force damage control efforts to access the effective areas from further away, which would hamper the effect effectiveness of the damage control crews. And of course, a few feet further up are the openings for the aft main gun turret. Water pouring into here, and thence into the barbette and the magazines, could have been enough to push the ship over the edge in terms of buoyancy. Plus, of course, an increased depth of water would have increased the angle of the ship, which would have made everything much more difficult to do, and the increase in water pressure on the already submerged parts of the ship would have made damage control efforts down in the depths of the ship even harder. Indeed, exactly this kind of progressive flooding, albeit at the other end, through upper deck areas, was what had ultimately doomed Lutzow after the Battle of Jutland. Although, in this case, Pennsylvania didn't also have to deal with holes that had been blasted in her upper works by shells, just the house size hole in her stern. Nonetheless, thanks to the heroic efforts of her crew and the assistance of various ships, including the tugs, she was relatively stable by the dawn of the 13th of August, albeit no one could determine if this would last. And with a ship in relatively deep waters, if something did go wrong, there was not likely to be any getting her back and so the decision was taken to carefully tow her to a shallower part of Buckner Bay, where, if worse came to worst, she would at least settle in a manner similar to the ships sunk at Pearl Harbour, i.e. in shallow enough water that it should be relatively easy to salvage her later on. This is recounted in the ship's deck logs between 1200 and 1600 hours, as Lieutenant Hawley, who'd been in charge between 0800 and 1200 of the ship's deck logs, had largely only had time to record the fact that Admiral Oldendorf and his staff, having boarded the day before, were now being transferred back to the Tennessee. Nonetheless, Lieutenant Asaf takes up the account 1229, USS Shackle ARS-9 cast off. 1258, set special sea and anchor detail. 1400, tug TBN comes alongside starboard bow. 1440, passed tow wire to ARS-10 ahead. 1454, underway from berth L-93, being towed by tugs to shift berths. Captain and navigator on the bridge, captain has the con. 1534, tug YTB-386 alongside starboard quarter. Then, between 1600 and 1800, Lieutenant Lochlin once again records, 1630, Task Group 95.3 stood out to sea, 1700, anchored in Buckner Bay, Okinawa in 13 fathoms of water, with 60 fathoms of chain on the starboard anchor, 1700, ARS-10 cast off, 1704, tug number 104 cast off starboard bow, YTB-336 cast off starboard side, 1713 secured sea and anchor detail. It wasn't quite over for Pennsylvania, though. That night, a number of Japanese aircraft, at least some of which were kamikazes, made another attempt on the fleet that was still present. Lieutenant Cates, who had the deck log between 1800 and 2000, records 
1907 Darkened Ship, 1917 Set Condition 1 in Secondary Battery and Close Range Weapons, 1946 Set Condition Zebra, USS Lagrange APA-124 on starboard beam of this ship range 2,000 yards hit by suicide plane, 1951 commenced firing secondary battery and close range weapons at enemy plane, 1954 ceased firing, 1956 flash red control yellow, 1957 commenced making smoke. Presumably at some point in the past 24 hours someone had brought some smoke generators aboard. Then, between 2000 and midnight, Lieutenant F. M. Hawley records 2005 commenced firing secondary battery to port at enemy plane. 2006 ceased firing. Ammunition expended this date 13 rounds 5 inch 38 AA common, 30 rounds 40 mm. 2009 flash red control yellow from Army Fighter Command. 2130 flash white control green from Army Fighter Command. 2210 lighted fires under number 3 boiler. 2240 secured number 6 boiler. The log then concludes for the day soberly with addendum to 0800 to 1200. At 10.30 hours, the bodies of W.L. Thompson, C.A. Schutzberg, J.B. Romer and C.E. Binger were recovered by divers from compartment D-421-S. Lieutenant Asaf then takes up the log on the 14th of August from 0 hundred hours, i.e. midnight, to 0400. 0 hundred hours anchored in Buckner Bay, Okinawa in 13 fathoms of water with 60 fathoms of chain on the starboard anchor. Damage control parties and salvage parties and equipment from USS Extricate ARS-16, USS Memnomini ATF-73 and USS Shackle ARS-9 are repairing and dewatering compartments flooded by torpedo damage. Boiler number three is online for auxiliary purposes. Ship is in condition IE-AA. Material condition Zebra is being maintained. Ship is darkened except to facilitate ship's work. Then Lieutenant Lachlan, who is taking up the deck log between 0400 and 0800. 0528 USS Shackle ARS-9 cast off starboard quarter. 0558 lighted ship. 0559 set material condition modified zebra 0632 sounded fire call fire in number three blower room 0636 secured from fire call 0636 fire extinguished with slight damage to a blower panel box and two cables 0711 task group 95.3 stood in and anchored over the next couple of days damage control efforts continued with occasional fires breaking out and being dealt with on the morning of the 15th, the ship's company was informed that the Japanese government had formally accepted the Allied surrender terms, albeit with the loss of a number of their friends and colleagues in that grey area between the announcement of Japanese intent and the announcement of Japanese acceptance of surrender, there was understandably little celebration aboard Pennsylvania. However, with the immediate danger passed over the next couple of weeks, the by now relatively mundane job of salvaging and lightening the ship began to be carried out. Each night, the secondary batteries and the close-range weapons were manned, just in case another Japanese aircraft came in. But, for example, between 2000 hours and 2400 hours on the 15th of August, shortly after receiving word of the Japanese formal surrender, the only entry in the log is from Lieutenant McCarthy, who records 2020 hours, H.J. Brewer received clean-cut laceration about two inches long in scalp when shield from blinker tube fell and struck him in the head. Cut was cleaned, three sutures taken, Mirthralite cocoon dressing applied, and Brewer returned to duty. On the morning of the 16th, between 0 hundred hours and 0 400 hours, Lieutenant Cates recalled that, as a result of torpedo damage, the ship is down by the stern to a draft of 41 feet. The draft forward is 29 feet. Salvage operations are being conducted. Boilers number 1 and 2 are in use for auxiliary purposes. Condition of readiness 1 easy is set in the secondary battery and close range weapons. Material condition modified zebra is set. There is actually footage of the salvage work being undertaken that's available from the US National Archives. However, it has yet to be digitized and therefore can't be downloaded. But if anybody happens to be in the area of the US National Archives and wants to go and have a look, I'm sure they'll be able to accommodate you. Also on the 16th, work began on lightening the ship. Between 0800 and 1200, Lieutenant Hayes recorded that 
aircraft started to be removed from the ship. Plane number 26 was lowered into the water for delivery to USS Alaska, and plane number 25 was lowered into the water for delivery to a pool of aircraft that would be used for search and rescue. Between 1200 and 1600 hours, Lieutenant McCarthy recorded that they had started to unload the main battery powder. Most of the magazines had been flooded in the immediate aftermath of the torpedo hit, and so it was pretty much useless anyway, but the ammunition itself in terms of the shells could at least be salvaged. It, he also noted that at 1255, USS Shackle, ARS-9, came alongside briefly to transfer a 6-inch submersible pump aboard. Having spent most of the day sorting through the ammunition, between 1800 and 2000, Lieutenant Hawley records that 177 charges for the 14-inch 45 caliber guns at full charge and 35 reduced charges were taken out to sea and dumped because of the saltwater damage. The next day, more powder was taken off, and Lieutenant Hayes, recording between 1200 and 1600 hours, was also able to record another injury report. He records, In the case of B.E. Taylor, U.S. Navy, while Taylor was putting hatch on director, the cover slipped from his hand, causing semicircular laceration around the distal end of right great toe over the nail bed. The distal phalange was broken. Disposition, soap and water scrub, wound flushed with saline, nail removed, four sutures, taken sulphur crystals and sterile dressing applied. Admit admitted to sick bay. So basically he was trying to put the cover on a fire control director and dropped it on his foot. Towards the end of the 17th, an updated list of ammunition from the flooded magazines that was chucked over the side or deep-sixed into further depths of the ocean was recorded as 456 tanks of 14-inch 45 powder for reduced charges, 118 tanks of 14-inch 45 powder at full charge, 18 100-pound bombs, 12 350-pound bombs, 100 pyrolin wads, and 50 Mark IV flares. On the 18th, Lieutenant Hawley recorded another injury happening in the early afternoon, this time, S.W. Ragsdale, U.S. Navy, while climbing inside turret 3, touched electric wire on electric deck and fell 30 feet to handling room deck. Received stellate lacerations left forehead and right scalp, laceration over right eye. Patient received sterile shave and prep preparatory suture of wounds, observation in sickbay for 24 hours. And in the evening, Lieutenant McCarthy recorded still more tanks of ammunition being taken out and chucked away, now including 55 boxes of fuses, 212 32 pound catapult service charges, 27 catapult test charges, 948 5 inch 38 cartridges consisting of 348 service charges, 504 flashless charges, 96 reduced charges, and 1280 40 mm cartridges in 80 tanks. By the 19th, the handling of damaged ammunition was completed, and one DJ Boga, or Bodger, possibly, of the US Navy Reserve managed to get a 4-inch laceration on his scalp when he smacked into a hatch whilst going up a ladder. Nonetheless, the final count of ammunition taken from the flooded magazines and discharged on the 19th included 3,296 40mm cartridges of incendiary ammunition, 1,408 40mm cartridges of regular ammunition, 24,120 20mm cartridges of incendiary, 1,980 20mm cartridges of standard ammunition, 1,153 5-inch 38 powder charges, of which 780 were service and 373 were flashless, and 749 5-inch 38 powder charges for reduced charge use. So, if anybody wants to find some 20mm or 40mm ammunition, I'd suggest Buckner Bay is probably somewhere to look. It pretty much goes on like this all the way through to Tuesday the 28th, at which point it's recorded in the morning that the draft aft was 37 foot 1 inch, so it's only gone up by about 3 feet. The draft forward was 30 foot 5 inches, having gone down somewhat because obviously the aft was coming up. And at this point, Pennsylvania was about as ready as she was ever going to be. And so she set out for what would turn out to be a rather long journey to Guam. Her war diary records that at the end of the month, 
At 0600, 28th of August, USS Tenino, ATF-115, passed a tow wire which was shackled to Pennsylvania's port anchor chain. USS Serrano passed tow wire to Tenino, which was secured to a bridle. Two light harbour tugs came alongside to assist in steering. At 0632, got underway for Guam in accordance with Port Director Okinawa Dispatch 270200 of August. Proceeding out of port was accomplished without incident, but with difficulty due to a tendency of this ship to yaw widely. At 0749, passed through nets, the two light tugs cast off. At 0820, veered chain to 60 fathoms. At 1010, took departure with Suken Shima light bearing 292.3, distance 11.4 miles, on course 130, speed about 6 knots. At 11.20, USS Serrano lost the tow because of a broken ring in the towing bridle. At 1400, Serrano resumed towing. It was found by experience that the yaw could be checked considerably by use of number 4 propeller as a steering aid. It was so used for the remainder of the trip. The ships in company for the trip to Guam were designated Task Unit 95.3.9 and included, in addition to Pennsylvania and towing tugs, the destroyer escorts Daly and Gendrau and the salvage tug ATR-9. On the 31st of August 1945, the weather became rough due to the influence of a typhoon several hundred miles to the south. Speed was reduced by this rough weather to about three knots, but on the following day the weather moderated and speeds of six to seven knots were attained. By September the 6th, Pennsylvania had arrived at Guam, and on the 7th she entered floating dry dock ABSD-3 for further repairs. This took the form primarily of a very large piece of steel sheet that was welded over the massive hull, and this, along with other repairs, meant that she was able to leave under her own power in early October with escort from the cruiser Atlanta and the destroyer Walk. Stopping occasionally to check the patch with divers and later on to cut off number three propeller when the shaft broke as the prop became unbalanced, Pennsylvania would eventually crawl into Puget Sound on October the 24th, 1945, almost, but not quite, beaten by the last major successful Japanese attack of World War II. Old and damaged, the ship was then selected for use in the atomic bomb tests of Operation Crossroads, but she took the detonation of a pair of 23 kiloton atomic bombs in stride, the second one being detonated only a kilometre away. After further studying of the effects of these two blasts on her, the ship would eventually be scuttled on the 10th of February 1948 off Kwajalein Atoll. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.